Camilla, you're working at pack base of the kitchen. Yes. And you sliced off your left thumb. I did. What happened? Um, it was a morning. Um, I came in and the my salad chef girl was not there that morning. And um, one of the things I had been doing to really make it a better scene food-wise is I had an enormous salad bar. Like, enormous. Because I felt that was a way to really get people healthy. Anyway, so it takes a good four hours to produce. Okay, so the girl who's in charge of that is not there. So I'm frantically cutting vegetables and preparing stuff at a double speed along the side of my other cooking, which I always cook the soups, and then I had a boy under me. His name is Michael. He's not a boy anymore. He's a man. But Michael would cook the hot food, and we had a certain delegation. There was only six of us, five of us, cooking for the 1,000 each meal. So it was a very, very, very tight ship that you had, you had no room for anything except for the exact plan thing. So I am cutting um, lettuce, and I literally, the, the, the knife went straight through my nail all oh. the way through, and it just hung on a little piece on the back. Oh. Sorry I had to say this on video, no, but no. yeah. Um, I held it tight and decided that's it. Girls don't lose fingers. I am going to get this fixed. Mind you, this is the second time I got, I got it four years early. I had also cut my finger, but it wasn't as bad. Okay, so I get taken across to Kaiser Hospital, which is right across the street by the medical officer. Yes. Uh, her name is Adrian. Now, just so people know, when you say medical officer in, in the Church of Scientology, it's not a doctor or a nurse. No. It's just... It's an administrative person who, yeah. you know, who deals with the, anything that's a medical issue that has to be taken care so of. they take you over to Kaiser. Takes me to Kaiser. I wait in the emergency room for about two hours. And um, I finally see the surgeon and he's like, ooh, okay. And he gave me the whole thing. He sewed my whole finger back together and came out beautifully. Um... I came back that day, and he I was ordered off work. Sure. So in the way it translates, because the way it translates in there or whatever, is that I wasn't on the floor cooking. I mean, I had a, like a big band-aid. I just cut my finger. Not a band-aid, like a sure, yeah. wraparound. Like yeah. I looked like yeah, guys. I just came out of the hospital. Um, so I was doing right-hand only um, work on the computer in the office. And then the next day I slept in and that was a whole big thing that was, I was called out on that for being. For sleeping in. Because I was in pain, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of painkillers, but I really had to take them. But painkillers make me mentally disturbed. So my side effects of whenever I do have to do painkillers is horrific. Now, you're, you had a, uh, so you've almost sliced off your finger. You do need some painkillers. They do have side effects. Yeah. So I and come back and then I am talking to not my boss, but my boss's boss, and she's the one who is running the whole division for all the physical repairs and maintenance of all thing in, in within the church Sea Org. It's called Estates. Her name is Rebecca Christensen. Um, she. And I can never believe this, and I'll never forget this to my day that I die. She was like, you really did that on purpose, didn't you? Are you kidding me? She said that to you? Yes, she did. That you almost sliced your thumb off on purpose? Yes. Why would she say such a stupid, cruel thing? Because that was her view of life, I guess. I, we didn't really have a really strong relationship. But what did that make you feel like? Oh, I was mad. I was fuming inside. I didn't really show it because if you show it, it gets even worse. I really learned how to not show my emotions. I mean, anything I ever said in the church was edited. Like I had a filter system deeper than your air conditioner trying to figure out what I could say and not say, not even trying to figure out, to edit so that I don't say the wrong thing to the wrong person at the wrong time, which I still did a lot of the time, but I did it less. You become like an animal where you react to pain. I hate to give that analogy, but it's true. No, like, no. Yeah. you don't want the pain. You don't want the in your face. You don't want... I, I, my term for it is face ripping. I, I know that it's American word, or English word, but that's, you know, you just get your face ripped off. Like, well, yeah, that's a Scientology term, face ripping. Or, or they love to use the term. But here you've had a very bloody, 
horrible accident, and you get invalidated, you get blamed. You did it on purpose. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen oh, that way. Nobody would cut their thumb off. Well, Almost. there's not really, any, well, not even really. There is no medical insurance for the church. I, I, if there is, I have no idea. No, no, there, there is none. There is none because whatever. Okay, so there is none. So if you get hurt like that, I got hurt in the kitchen cutting lettuce, so that's a workman's comp, and I go to the workman's comp. But if you're typing and you're typing lettuce, letters, and you sh mess up your shoulder or you get carpent tunnel syndrome or whatever, you know, that becomes workman's comp. Like anything that fits under a work injury is workman's comp, but you work. 14 hours a day. So pretty much anything from when you breathe, when you wake up, till when you breathe, when you go to sleep, falls under the workman's comp. I just know that we were, we, the church, was, the bills were too high. And, and I can see how. Everything was shoved under there because there is no other insurance. So in order to, let me clarify, in order to cover medical expenses, they're trying to shoehorn or make everything fit into workman's comp. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say... But I can also tell you, because the insanity is, if you work 14 hours a day, then, yeah, well, it, fatigue, it does fall under. That's the craziness of it. Well, yeah, but look at that. The fatigue, the lack of sleep will cause accidents. Of course. Also, the, what they call the heavy messed work. Yeah. You're going to get hurt. I, I mean... I. I saw, not uh, six months ago, a young lady carrying two five-gallon buckets of water up to the planters there on Fountain. That's insane. She was, instead of a hose, mm -hmm. and these had to weigh 40 pounds a piece. Mm -hmm. uh, water's eight pounds per gallon. Mm -hmm. like, why is she made to carry it? That's shoulder strain. I know. And that, that's what gets done, except if you have to go to a specialist of some sort, or you have to go, um, I've seen different things, like a friend that I work with, um, he had to get heart surgery, that was paid for, it came out of the financial planning, but it's an ongoing thing for three months to come up with that amount of money to go do that. So would it be fair to say that the Church of Scientology's basic plan for health care is either workman's comp, taxpayer-funded freeloading at okay. county hospitals, sure. and as a last resort, they'll self-fund? Yes, and um, I know that for a fact because I was so sick. Like, it wasn't even a question about it. Like, I, I had migraine headaches to the point of going unconscious practically at least one every 10 days to two weeks. Yeah, crippling migraines. Okay, is that what you call yeah. them? Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, anyway, and I had all kinds of internal issues, and I internal pains, and we kept trying to figure it out, and I went to a homeopathic doctor who said, well, diagnose exactly what was wrong by testing, sure. not by looking at my eyes or something crazy, but actual machine testing. Yeah. It's your so liver. How much was the treatment? Uh, um, that treatment was, well, the treatment I never got because it wouldn't be financed. But, I mean, how much would it have been? Um, probably two hundred dollars a month. So that's cheap treatment. I know. And the church wouldn't pay two hundred a month. Well, here's the life. real truth of it. You know, I've healed myself now since I've been out. Yes. And yes. I spent two hundred fifty dollars a month. I didn't in the beginning because I was so poor, but as soon as I was up and running and had money, I started invest investing it into the proper things that would take care of my liver and my kidney because that is th that was what was wrong with me. My liver and my kidney were shutting down, and I had. Um, well, you, you candida, were, horrific, severe candida. When I finally candida. actually made it to a doctor who did proper standard doctor analysis, what was really wrong with me was candida. Yeah, I know another young man who suffered from that and almost killed him, and he was Sea Org. We've interviewed him, yeah. Jason Barkley. And it's shocking that they wouldn't take care of this problem for you. Now, you, you basically blew 
you basically escaped from the Sea Org to save your own life to get the I medical did. care you need. How did your blow happen? How did you escape? Um, I was going to cooking school out in Culver City, and um, I had planned. Um, I didn't hadn't even planned it for long. I had planned for six months to blow. Um, I hadn't figured out how, and then suddenly one day to the next, it just came to me. Um, I had already bought, uh, not bought, but I had um, sent out little applications for credit cards. They were sort of small because I had obviously sure, no yeah. credit rating. So I had two blank credit cards that I'd never used. And um, I just took my vital belongings, which was like my chef knives, my computer, my green card, my passport, and that's about it. Did you get on a bus or a plane? No, I walked down the street. And I walked down the street at 10 o'clock at night in Culver City. Didn't know where I was. I had about $100 in cash on me, $150 in cash. And I just walked and I knew that nobody would follow me because I didn't know where I was going and I had no idea where I was going to sleep. I had no clue. I just kept walking and then a bus came up and it says Santa Monica. I was like, that's a great place to go. So I jumped on the bus and drove to Santa Monica. I would at least been there before so I had some way around and I found a... Um, What's it called? A um, it's a new form of hotels that I call hostels. Yes. Because it's dormitories, so it's thirty-five dollars a night, and I had a dormitory bed with four were, of the you, girls. But you were used to. A I didn't. That didn't bother me yeah. for a hoot. I just put my belongings under me, and I slept on top of my bag, so nobody could steal it because I didn't really know the real world, and I couldn't afford to lose my last little things that I owned, and. Um, yeah, so I stayed there in Santa Monica, and then uh, I finally contacted my sister, who didn't want to have anything to do with me at all. She's like, the church is going to come search for you. I don't want to have any of this noise in my life. I don't want it. Get out of here. And then we talked for a little bit, and she's like, you look sh like shit. I have never seen you look this bad. Like, you look like a raccoon. You have black rings under your eyes. Like, what is going on? And I said, well, I'm sick as a dog. I need a place to go. She goes, well, where do you want to go? And I said, I have no idea. Midwest. I need to get away. Midwest. She goes, good. Go to Montana, Idaho. I said, good. Well, Montana, I can't drive. I love it. It's beautiful there. I'll go to Idaho. She goes, where do you want to go? I said, uh, Idaho Falls. Good. Idaho Falls. Got me a Greyhound bus and went to Idaho Falls the next morning. Wow. I had no idea where I was going. When I arrived in Idaho Falls, I hitchhiked, got down to downtown, found a place, signed in the Best Western. I lived the Best Western until I had no more money. And then I was like, maybe I should go find a job and a place to lay, live, and then I found a place to live by this hotel, this own old hotel. It was like, it was an apartment complex, um, but fairly inexpensive, and um, the guy there somehow felt he should help me and let me stay there for free for the first month. Oh, see. So, I, you know, I didn't have anything. I mean, the first month I was counting every penny. I mean, I would go sure. days with no money. I had an Amazon account. So I bought, I had no sheets. The first night that I slept in Idaho, not in the hotel, but in my own new little apartment that had a bed and a sofa and a chair. I felt like it was a prison. You know, it had that, yeah. you know, it was close. But it was still a place that I was mine. I was safe. And I had my two chef jackets. One my sister gave me and then the own, my own that I've been wearing and that was my blankets. Wow, so you can survive on next to nothing. Camilla, you have such a great story of courage in the face of adversity, <laughs> the will Thank to you. escape. <laughs> Camilla, if somebody in the Sea Org is watching this and they're thinking of blowing, what would you tell them from your heart? What you get told about the outside world is so not true. People are loving. People are caring. People will help you. Um, and you can totally live, even if you leave on no money. Thank mm -hmm. you.